Ted, in, in 19... Oh, three on here. Oh, Andrew, tell me, tell me your name. Uh, Edward Francis. Okay. Is that good? Mm -hmm. um, and first of all, in 1914, tell me what was going on in your life, and did you hear anything about what was going on in Sarajevo? Well, in, in 1914, I had a, a very mundane job. Uh, working at a, a stationery which uh, uh, was in contact with several firms making their stationery as they like it. And I was the one who chose the paper for the envelopes of writing uh, in that particular. It was only a small firm, about 20, and they was all older than me. In fact, I was the youngest one there. And... Uh, when I did read the paper in August 1914 that the Austrian king had been assassinated in Austria uh, on a visit, I, I, I never connected that in any way with a war with Britain. I thought this was out of our reign altogether. I thought it was between Germany and, and other countries, but not us. It, I had no idea that war was impending. But uh, uh, later on, in two days' time, on August the, 20, August the 6th, uh, uh, war was declared with England because the Germans had invaded France. And uh, we, we had a contract kind of thing with France that if they was attacked, we should help them. And uh, personally, I didn't think a lot of that, but we did, and uh, we more or less had to assist the French in keeping back the Germans who were already uh, going all over France and uh, with the idea of taking over the country. And of course England must have a reply for that and they declared war. And uh, I was still at my work when uh, all the girls there were girls that was mostly married women, elderly, as I've said before, I was the youngest one there. And uh, they said, on August the 6th when I was there, they said, Ted, you can't stop here now. I said, why not? They said, well, there's a war on there. Uh, uh, have you seen Lord Kitchener pointed at you, saying that the, the, the country needs you? You must go and enlist. I said, but I'm not old enough. I said, I'm only 18. I said, you can't enlist until you're 19. Oh, the, the, and they talked and talked and talked. And somehow, I thought, well, that wouldn't be a bad idea, getting rid of this mundane job. And, of course, as a boy of eight, I, I, I loved the tin drum in front of me and marching up and down with the uh, youngsters. And uh, I was also in the Boy Scouts, and I liked that. So I thought, well, perhaps it'd be a good idea. And I stood in a queue at the Birmingham Town Hall. As you know, it's a large building. There was a large queue there on two days after war was declared. And uh, I joined the queue to enlist. But what I didn't know, we kept a public house at the time. And what, what I didn't know, that two of our customers had passed by and recognised me. And, of course, they went straight to my mother and father and said, your Ted is in a line for enlisting as a soldier. No, they, of course, they, they went absolutely mad. Anyway, I, I passed very easily. I was very fit in those days uh, and uh, fond of all kinds of sports and exercise. And uh, when all, I'd really signed on and took the oath and the shilling, the king's shilling, as they called it then, I well, let me ask another question. When when was the first time that when did you first get a sense that you might become involved in this war? Personally or yeah, the country? Pers personally. Personally. Yeah, when was the first Yes. Well, obviously, uh it was the first day I enlisted. If I enlisted it wasn't like enlisted in peacetime. Uh, 
I enlisted to, to fight the Germans, to keep the Germans back, as everyone did. What did, it, what did everybody think? Were you the only one that was enlisted? What was, what was the spirit at the time? What was the what? The spirit. What was the attitude of oh, all Oh, the friends? spirit. Wait, wait once... Okay, now go ahead. The spirit, really, was absolutely... They couldn't get to be a soldier quick enough because there were so big queues they had to tell them to come next day. And uh, w when I got home and my mother says, have you enlisted as a soldier? I said, yes. Says, you little fool. She says, only thieves and vagabonds joined the army, which was more or less true in those days. And she says, you go back and tell them you've changed your mind and you don't want to be a soldier. I says, mother, I can't do that. I've taken an oath for king and country and I can't break that. And even if I did, I should be arrested. So she said, oh, and I, she said, I suppose you'll be in France in a couple of days and I said, I can't see you again. I said, no, mother, you've got it wrong. I said, we should have at least six to eight months training right here in England, not very far away. Uh, at that, she seemed comforted a bit and she said, you'll be able to come home then. I said, yes. Well, at that time, why I don't know, everyone, everyone thought the war would be over at Christmas. And that was why there was such a rush to get in to be a soldier. They thought, uh, really thought, uh, and uh, quite a, a number of uh, essential people, they thought. And uh, with that thought, my mother was satisfied. She says, always oh, love your home be Christmas. And that was the end of that. But I didn't know that that was the last time I should see my mother alive because after five months training, not very far away in Morwood, which is only 30 miles away, uh, I had to get leave there to attend a funeral. Did, did you know what this war was about? Oh yes, very much so. As I've said before, we had got a pact with France that if ever she was attacked, uh, England would come to her aid. And uh, she was being attacked very, very much so. There was already at the quarter of France and advancing. So that, that was a, a, one good reason for everyone, from the private upwards, to go and enlist. And you, you mentioned that your mother said that it was only vagabonds who joined the army. What was different about this? Beg pardon? What was different about this? Why were so many people like yourselves, young professionals, joining? <laughs> well, like, like so many people myself, you must remember that the ages was anything from 16 and a half uh, 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 putting themselves at 19 when it came to a list to about 22. Every young man had that idea. You see, wages in those days of jobs were very, very poorly paid. And uh, you worked for 15 shillings a week, and that was less than a pound for, for 48 hours. And that's why this seemed a wonderful opening for adventure, something they'd read about in books, like the Charge of the Life Brigade or or the, the South African War. You see, those who read books in the free library, as I had, I thought, oh, it was wonderful to be a soldier. And that's why I joined more than anything. And what was different about the battalion that you joined? Was it, it was a city battalion. They called them power yeah. battalions, didn't they? What, well, was, what was that about? Well, most big towns uh, had uh, their own battalions. In other words, they was uh, built up by people who worked there, the same as I was built up in and around Birmingham. And uh, they thought they would start a battalion. But so big was the rush to get to, uh, to, get to be a soldier, to, uh, to be a, they thought the one thing of the young chaps there was if I don't hurry up, I shall be out a bit. Each with the idea that this war would be over at Christmas and they wanted to get in and be there. And uh, 
uh, it was necessary to to uh, the, the the thought that it was necessary at least six months training never crossed my idea or any other people but that was the case uh, uh, until 1917 18 when we were short of men we were scraping the bottom of the barrel uh, in 1918 we had to go around all the people on munitions and see if a, a lady or a woman could do the same in order to uh, uh, to get men to join the army. And there was no if or but. You'd got to join the army, you see, in those times. And uh, So what, what was different about the PALs? Different about? What was different about the PALs battalions? Oh, yes, well, the PALs was first thought of uh, practically uh, almost uh, on the 4th of the, uh, of August, so that was when the war broke out. It said that uh, uh, it would make a battalion of the workers of Birmingham uh, and uh, of the surroundings. And uh, the idea at first was to make one battalion, which was roughly about a thousand men. But uh, uh, to their greatest surprise, 4,500 men in the end uh, volunteered for the Birmingham battalions and they had to make it three battalions and not one. And uh, I was in the 16th, although I, I joined only two days after the war, the, the, there were so many wanted to get in the city battalions, the Birmingham city battalions as they was called, uh, I was in the 16th and the, the three battalions was called the 14th, 15th and 16th Royal Warwick's or the 1st, 2nd and 3rd. But, but what did it mean? Who were, who were you fight? Who were you going to war with? What did, it, what did it mean to be in such a battalion? Who would you well, be going to well, war with? Uh, well, uh, we all spoke the same language and the same twang, more or less. And, and, and uh, uh, you see, when training... Uh, and it was all from Birmingham or just around, you quickly made friends of your own kind. Uh, and uh, that was a great thing. It was quite different to join in the army and not knowing where you was going or wh what battalion was going in. So did you know people? Did you know people who joined up with you? Oh, yes, scores of them, yes, yes. And uh, the best time, actually, of the war was by eight months of training before we went to France. And there, as you see on various photographs that I had, we, I was in a section of about 14 men, and we came like one good family. We knew about e everybody's uh, home life and where we came from and what we thought of the war, etc. And that grew up, you see, in uh, eight months or 12 months of training until we were so itchy to get to France. You see, the, the, great, the great idea, or whoever thought it of, that the war would be over at Christmas, that was getting at our lads. They thought they'd be too late, it'd be all over. And they really badly wanted, and I was the same, badly wanted to get to France to get in the fighting. Because as I say, uh, fighting, we called it, but uh, don't forget, we was innocent 18-year-olds, and we didn't know much about it, only from books. And you couldn't rely on those books because they was years and years old, like the South African War, when most the soldiers was on horseback. So, did you... What, we'll move on in just a moment, but just tell me briefly, did you join up with your... with? any brothers or with your with friends or were there other people that you knew on that line at the town hall no uh, friends i had very little it but uh, one of the biggest surprises to me my elder brother four years older who had uh, only just passed for an accountant uh, uh, after i'd been in the army five months I had a, a card, a letter from him saying he, he joined also the city battalions. 
Well, that was a big surprise for me because uh, Harry was a well-educated sort of man and was uh, about to start his own business. And I thought, well, uh, it was, he must have the pull as I've got to get into the army to see these things through. And uh, we, although, although we wasn't uh, exactly together in the battalion, uh, we saw a lot of each other, more so in France than in England. And what would people say to you if you didn't join up? If, if you didn't join up? Oh, well, the war had only been on two or three days, and I was walking downtown, and an elderly lady came to me and says, what are you doing here? I says, what do you mean? She says, don't you know there's a war on? And she picked a, a white feather out of her bag and gave me. Well, I was very annoyed at that. And uh, if it was a man, I should have punched his nose. But she was a lady and she made it made off. But uh, I reported to the officer when I got back to camp. And he says, oh, that won't do. And he made that little, bag, uh, that little disc, as you see on my coat, uh, which says... City of Birmingham Battalion, 1914, with the Royal Crown above it. What, uh, what did a white feather mean? A white feather means you're a coward. You, you should have joined up, but you're a coward. You're frightened. Which, which wasn't the case. Oh, it wasn't the case. I was a soldier then, but no uniform. You see, uh, uh, they had tens of thousands of uniforms to be made, quick, and uh, we wasn't prepared for war in any way, either in munitions or uniforms or, or anything else. And we had to wait a considerable time until the generous Birmingham Corporation came in and said, for the three battalions, we'll, uh, we'll buy them all a blue uniform. And I, I had to go with it. They bought us a splendid outfit which we wore for about four or five months until we had khaki. You see, there were so many thousands of men wanted khaki uh, uniforms that they couldn't uh, cope with it. Uh, and we were very glad, uh, uh, the Birmingham Council, to give us all a really good uniform, which looked very smart. Uh, that was uh, uh, absolutely fitted to us in a few weeks' time. And, of course, that had to go when we had khaki uniforms. Um, did you, what, what sort of training did you get? Did you think you got proper training for the oh. war that you wound up fighting? We, we, because we was the first, you see, we was the first to join up uh, only the, uh, a week after the war started. We had a wonderful training, and every man jack of us enjoyed it to the full. We went to Malvern, which is about uh, 30 miles from Birmingham, a lovely place, a little co cottage town, I called it, and the people there gave us a wonderful welcome, and uh, we, we was out uh, in tents. Each section or company all got together, and uh, the training of which I was uh, training before I joined up. I was very, very strong. I used to hold exhibitions in the back of my father's pub in lifted weights that six-foot policemen strong couldn't touch. And uh, I enjoyed all the work that the army could give us. Uh, but of course, uh, we didn't stop all the while there. We moved to various places and uh, came the great day for us young ones when they issued us with a rifle, uh, uh, the newest Lee Enfield rifle. That was, uh, if you'd have seen some of the lads looking at it and uh, never held a gun in their life, and uh, afterwards polishing it, and, uh, and then afterwards... We went to the range where we uh, have so many bullets to fire at a target to see what sort of a shot we were. Uh, this, this training experience, the experience that you were getting in a field in England, was, was that, in looking back, was it the right sort of preparation that oh, you needed? We had the 
best preparation that any battalions who followed us because they hadn't the time. You see, where we had eight months, the following battalions, because the men was wanted so quickly in France, the men was uh, got ready in four months. Well, they didn't have a, a training like we had. But did, did your instructors know anything about trench warfare at that point? Big problem. Did your instructors know anything about trench warfare at that point? Well, no, they didn't. You see, most of our NCOs, sergeants, corporals of that, were old soldiers of the South African War who had been retired, more or less. They was old enough to be my father. But they was in charge. They had been in army probably for 16, 17, 18 years and been called up again to look after us boys. And uh, uh, they knew their job and they did it thoroughly. And uh, we was con congratulated as a battalion by the high officers when we was ready to go to France. But I guess my, my question, were they perhaps, were they training you for a different sort of war than the one that you would wind up fighting? Well, well they couldn't really. They, they tried to. You see, what we were training for was a trench war. Uh, no, nobody in South Africa or any other battle had known a trench war, a war where you were in trenches facing each other and with shells coming over every minute. The, these people knew nothing about that uh, uh, until people who had been in France pray for a few months were sent back to England and they took over the training, knowing what we'd got to put up with. So, so what, what, did you, what did you expect? Did, when did it hit you that this was going to be a very different sort of war? When did, it, when did it hit you personally? Well, I used to, I, I read Lord Kitchener's report after the war had been on a month, and he ridiculed the idea that this war would be over at Christmas. He says, I give this war four years, and it was, well, six months out. The war was on four years and six months. And uh, that... That didn't, uh, uh, it was in the papers, of course, and, but it didn't upset our lads. If it had said 10 years, we were still in England, mind you. We knew nothing, we were absolutely itching to go to France, but we had no idea what it was like when we got there. Uh, all we was thinking about, we must get to France uh, before the war's over. Everyone had the idea there was going to be a short war the moment the English came in, or oh, the war they thought was finished, but it wasn't. So when, when in France, when, when, when you were already in France, did you realise that this was going to be a mm. difficult and brutal war? When did it first... Well. Uh, we crossed over to France after we finished our tra training, and uh, our first our first uh, look was that we landed at Boulogne, and we had to walk at least 15 miles to where our camp was. Well, 15 miles in full equipment on as well, and carrying all the things that we had to in those days, uh, was along, and uh, most of us were exhausted and uh, some of them actually fell out. But we stayed at the camp only a short time before we, we went to uh, uh, a, little, a little village called Bray that was on the sub, Bray the sub, where uh, the war was quiet there. When I say quiet, they were facing each other in trenches, but there was no attempt to go any further. We wasn't attacking them, and they wasn't attacking us. But there was bullets and shells and bombs every minute of the day trying to hit someone. And uh, they was called quiet trenches for the new people from England to get broke in as to what... Uh, 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 the weather, of course, at that time was not too bad. Uh, 
but uh, came the time that it was our turn to go up into the trenches. And we was all uh, more or less all very pleased with that. And uh, uh, the, uh, the regiment coming out was an old regiment that had been there almost since the start. And uh, they looked at us and smiled as if to say, <laughs> you're smiling now, but you won't be later. And anyway, we passed seven days and nights in there. And uh, be beyond heavy shelling and uh, machine gun firing, uh, nobody was hurt. And after a week, we ca came out. And uh, our next, we had a rest of six days or seven days, and back we went again. And then came the greatest sensation, I call it, but it wasn't a sensation. Someone said to us excitedly, Jack Smith. I said, what about him? I knew Jack Smith. He's dead. He's been shot. The first one of the battalion to be shot. I said, what? Yes, he's dead. He's been shot. He put his head too far over and a sniper got him. And that caused a bit of a sensation amongst the, the lads. They thought, well, uh, this is not exactly what we come for kind of business. But later on, from that day onwards, when we went to the trenches, it was three kill, four kill, five kill, 20 kill, a hundred kill. And then, by then, we was veterans. We knew all about the trenches and its risks and what we had to do and uh, what we had to suffer because after a week in the trenches or a fortnight in the trenches, with, uh, when the winter came on with modern water, you've got to put up with lice and rats. Rats was in the hundreds everywhere. If we was billeted when we came out to a French shed or something at a farm, you couldn't get a good sleep. We slept on the floor, no beds. You couldn't get a good sleep because the rats would nibble your ears and you had to wake up and shoo them away. But how describe describe for me the trench what it was like to live in those trenches for a week at a stretch. Yeah. When the conditions started getting really bad. Well, when the trench uh, when the weather changed to rain and mud uh, it is impossible almost to describe uh, the, the ground. You must remember that we had between two and three miles behind the trenches to walk to get into the trenches. And in that two, two mile walk, it was absolutely uh, terribly muddy. And sometimes it was in water up to your waist. And you got to walk it like that to do a week to before you got in the firing line. But uh, the idea of walking, it used to take us practically six or seven or eight hours to do that two miles, and we arrived at our posts in the front line of the trenches absolutely exhausted. Uh, because under those conditions, they couldn't bring food up. They couldn't bring water up. It was all spilled. All the people bringing it were shut down or shelled. And many and many a time, we'd only got the water and food that we carried. And it's got to last seven or eight days. So we was hungry and thirsty most of the time. And we got to keep a sharp lookout because the Germans was hotting it up, having little raids at night. We have to change the tape. Do you want a drink of water? Ted, when it was muddy and you were hungry and you were in the trenches, was this the adventure that everybody had expected? <laughs> I'm afraid not. Uh, we used to say, when we'd been there about six months or eight months, covered in mud, wet through practically all day, and uh, absolutely chewed up my lice, 
we used to say, and to think, when we was at lovely Morven training, we wanted to come to this hall. <laughs> I said, yes, we didn't know. But uh, as time went on, when we was there eight months, we felt like, you know, old soldiers. We'd been there, we could look upon the, uh, the new people coming, like we came eight months ago, and look at them and say, oh, you don't know what you're in for. But we did. And uh, the, the times that we went in, in and out, was coming to a close because they decided on this particular quiet sector to make an attack. There was a certain German trench, or oh, three or four hundred yards, maybe more, in front, that they decided that we have a go to take. And that means, of course, going over the top and uh, dashing for this trench. Well, in, in little assaults like that, uh, uh, they got as many guns going for f about four or five days as, as possible on the German lines. And uh, the Germans instinctively knew that something was going to happen. And that means us coming over. And of course, uh, the day came, the morning came rather, when uh, at uh, six o'clock or such times, uh, officers of which are down below us in the trenches with a whistle. And when they blow that whistle, we got to dash out of the trenches and make for this German place, German tents. And it, it, it is in those few f four or five minutes that we look, look at each other and say, this is the first time, we remember. We look at each other and say, oh, well, now I shall do this. Some were visibly shaking. Some were crying. Some were almost shell-shocked before they start because the noise then of all this... Uh, uh, shell fire on the Germans and our own machine guns and their machines going was enough. Uh, it's, it's perfectly true to say that everyone who was in France was afraid. But it's how they show it on the face that made the difference between a strong youth and a, and a weak man. And it's in those few minutes as we look at each other before we go over the top and wonder if they'll ever get through it. And they are visi visibly shaking. And I was uh, uh, not, not so bad as some of them, but I was wondering what we was in for. And of course, when the whistle went and we had to scramble over, uh, what caused most casualties was the fact that the Germans <coughs> oh, sorry <coughs> the Germans had got machine guns fixed on the top of your trench and if you got up too quickly you'd receive several bullets and that was a, a cause of a lot of casualties in that leap over the trench to to go to cover those three, four, five hundred yards, fortunately, they was covered with shells, and that's what we made for. Did you did you see this happen? Did you see somebody climbing up over the top and getting shot? Oh yes, many. And, and wait, what, once you see that, what makes you continue? Ah, <laughs> well, duty for a start. Um, a start. Bullet. Okay, start start from what what do you see? What does it look like? What does what look like? When you're waiting to go, is it up a ladder? Or are you scrambling over? Oh, yes, well, we, we did have ladder. Uh, uh, helps to get over. But the point is, it was foolish of the officers behind. And you must imagine in those days, it wasn't like the army of today. Uh, there was terrible discipline there. Say the wrong word and you was in for it, or the, if, if you walked the wrong way, you was in for it. And when you went over, a few yards behind you, the officer also 
had a whistle to blow, and he also had a loaded revolver in his right hand. And anyone was a bit slow to go over the top would receive a shot by his foot just to remind him that he was there and what about it over. But that was one, only... One moment. The problem there, with, try not to lean forward, Yeah. because the mic is pointed. It's all caught here, you see. Right, so you know what? I'll lean forward, and then wait for me to sit back before you answer. So, if can you hear me like this? Yeah? Yes. Good. Um, so describe that for me again. What would happen? What made you go over the top? Just... Again, what you just told me. Well, you've got to understand that the line to take this trench would probably be no less than 20 miles long, all along our line, not just our few. It was a, 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 a big assault, 20 miles long. And uh, as a, if... You didn't get over quickly, which was foolish, because to order men to go over the top where it's been cutted with machine gun bullets is ridiculous. And that's why I and many of the men hesitated till that machine gun, which passes over and goes away from you, uh, you take the uh, the time as when that machine gun is off your particular trench, that's the time to go over and dash for the nearest shell hole for protection. So what what encouraged people to go? If you if, Did you ever see anybody get shot through the head as they were going over the top? Oh. Well, des describe that for me and what, how it makes you feel. And what makes you keep going? Well, when, when you uh, see, you must understand that in, in the moment of going over, you're, you're not looking at other people. You only learn later on. If you take, if you take the trench which we went over to, to capture, we, uh, we got time to rest and time to talk. And one says to the other, where's Bill so-and-so? Oh, he's got it, he's killed. And so-and-so, so and so And then they talk about it. You can see there's friends of yours or people you know missing. And some are wounded and some are killed. Uh, and uh, you can talk to a man in the trench. Uh, and while you're talking, he accidentally looks over the top of it. And in that few seconds, the German snipers, which were the best in the world, they had the finest rifles, telescopic sights, masses, never misses. And with, uh, 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 to, to show your forehead for a few seconds means you're dead. And you, you, you fall to the bottom of the trench, and in three minutes you're dead. My brother had exactly the similar thing, although, of course, I'm speaking of 1980 now, when we'd been there for years. He was talking and, uh, to some pals of his in the trench and uh, accidentally raised his head just a shade. And in that moment, he had the bullet. But fortunately for him, it was half an inch. Uh, uh, half an inch saved his life because he had a, a, a great scar from his forehead to his back, which bled profusely, and they thought it, he would die. So were there often, you mentioned that the, that the soldier would fall back into the trench. Were, were you often in the trenches with, with dead soldiers all over? Oh, yeah, no. In the later years of 17 and 18, uh, you, uh, you could hardly, uh, well, you'd, whether you believe this or no, it's, it's truth. We put dead bodies in the bottom of the trench so that we could stand on them for, for, to keep dry. If we didn't, we, we got up to our knees in water. And a dead man is no good 
uh, uh, once his particulars, a name, a number, and all right, are taken, uh, was put, and on some occasion, dead bodies was put on the top of the trench to make it higher, so that we could walk uh, a bit better instead of crouching. Were these friends of yours? Were these people that you had, had how do people well, deal with this? Well, in, a, in an action like that over the top, you must remember that on the left side and the right side is different regiments altogether to the old. And of course, in the dash for this uh, tr German trench, uh, lots of people got mixed up together. Uh, uh, the, uh, the idea that, that we was all together is wrong. And sometimes one would get there and the next man would be six or seven yards away and wouldn't be in your battalion at all. He'd wandered from another battalion. And uh, the main thing was to get cover and keep alive. So w one, one additional question about going over the top. Knowing that you could get killed by a bullet very easily, yeah. was there, how did they, how did they get you to do it? Was it, was it the fear of getting <laughs> well, shot back by your officer or did they, did the rum ration help? Which, what, what was it that made you go over the top? Believe me, in those days, as I've said before, the discipline was so great that if you moved an eyelid the wrong way, you was for a charge. You see, if you was charged with anything in those days, it meant uh, a month in prison. This is in France. And in that month, it was tied to a wagon wheel, probably in the sun, or you was put, you had to carry a kit of about 60 or 70 pounds and made to run up and down 100 yards. And if you fell down, you would get kicked up the back to get up. And that was the, uh, the, the kind of action you would get from the, uh, the military police. And uh, if a man, I had an occasion, I was in the trenches at Passchendaele. And uh, we was due to come out. We'd done our seven or eight days when a young fellow, younger than me, he said he was only 17, and he was trembling from head to foot. His face was contorted. He said, where's the communication trench? Well, that's the trench the way out, you see. Two or three miles long, but it's the way out. I said, what do you want that for? He said, I can't stand anymore, I'm going out. I said, you damn fool, I said, if you go out there, so you'll be shot. He says, if I go the other way, I'll be shot. She says, so then he went. And in three weeks' time, when we was out, we had to parade in a four square, and a, a very high officer come galloping in the middle on his charger and read out that Private So-and-so uh, was found guilty of cowardice in front of the enemy and shot on such and such a date. That was the uh, the discipline in those days. You had to be very careful. In very early on, three of our men from college, three uh, of Oxford College, pals they was, they was in our battalion, and they all they was advised to put in for an officer. Well, one says yes and two says no. They wouldn't have promotion like I said. They'd stay as privates, thank you. Well, this one boy went away, came back in a fortnight as an officer, and when they met all, they laughed and joked and started pulling his uh, uniform a bit, took his hat off and marching up and down and laughing. What they didn't know was one of the high officers was just ma passing and he reported that and uh, uh, the, the two privates was hauled up and narrowly missed a prison sentence, was given a tell-over and the officer, he was said, if anything like that, that happens again, he, he, he wouldn't be an officer, he'd be a private again. Did you, did you feel trapped in the trenches? Yeah. Uh, wait, one Okay, if, if you could describe the reality 
yeah. of that battlefield for me? Well, it was, uh, of course, the first winter we had, and we saw what the snow and ice and, uh, and rain could do to the trenches. We, uh, we're amazed at us. And, uh, and how we got from one place to another was always terrible. Although they did issue long uh, rubber boots, they was practically no good because most of them was punctured and merely filled with water. But every everywhere you looked for miles was great holes uh, full of water and mud uh, and the trench. You see, to go up to the firing line is one main trench called a communication trench. And that, with constant shelling, was broken in lots of places. And when you came to the trench, when you've been walking with our head right uh, covered by the trench, you come to where it's been blown over, you've got to be very careful and go on your hands and knees because if you don't, you'll be picked up by the snipers. And, and, uh, and that, uh, the, the work that you had to do uh, in uh, ground coverage like that was absolutely unbelievable of what you could do. In the first place, they didn't think about you or what you suffered or whether you were thirsty or whether you were drinking. One question only, is your rifle free? If you wasn't, you was very likely put on a charge. And mud and mud was everywhere. So you had to look after your rifle. That was the main thing. That must work. That mustn't have mud on there. And uh, how 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 dangerous was that mud? They were. How how dangerous was that? It mud? was dangerous for those who got a a small wound, or a, 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 a leg wound where they couldn't stand up, uh, and they, therefore they couldn't. They got to wait for the uh, Red Cross men to pick them up and take them back to the first aid, but. You see, they were sitting on the ground near a great big shell hole as deep as this room. And they couldn't get up the cells, and they felt the cells slipping into this hole. And all the shouts in the world, although there was men passing a yard away, such was the uh, order, we couldn't even give them a hand. We couldn't, they was yelling for help because I was slipping in this hole, and once the water, which was poisoned with gas and God knows what, got into the wounds, uh, it was death. S stay sitting back, like you are, that's, that's good, and describe for me what it was like to come out of the trench after a week's time, when you're hungry, and what that walk is like with all the mud filled yeah. trench. Describe that for me. And well, the worst I had was at Passchendaele. Most terrible uh, engagement, I think, in all of France. And we had eight days of that. And, uh, but we shouldn't have done, but because the, uh, the regiment who was there to relieve us they couldn't get up because owing to the ground and being shelled a lot, there was a day late. However, the ground was so bad that the engineers uh, tried to put a long, a broad white tape along a path that they thought w would be best to walk. That's for us to walk out of the trenches because the actual communication trench was blown to bits and it was full of water and mud anyway. So you had to risk walking on the top, as we call it. And that was a risk because machine guns were still going and uh, shells were going. And if you thought they was coming near you, you had to drop in the mud, whether you liked it or no. But we did manage to walk and it took two and a half hours for us to get out and crawl to our rest outside. Uh, what did it look like when, when you passed shells, sh shell holes? What did it look like when you passed shell holes filled with mud? And what was the danger of slipping in like? Describe. Oh. 
describe it for me. It's very difficult to picture. Yeah. Well, uh, people were wounded in all places, not only in the trenches, but practically the, the whole uh, part of the grounds uh, for half a mile. At any time, you would have a shell come a few yards for you, uh, either kill you or badly wounded. And uh, it was almost impossible for these people who was badly wounded and lost the use of one leg uh, to, get, to get down, to walk towards the rear. They couldn't. Uh, and I say that the danger was that the, they, was, uh, they was too badly wounded to f get their own little dressing out. Each soldier carries a little dressing, but not big. They couldn't, uh, hadn't got uh, the strength to do that. And you might be wounded in the leg, but if the water out of the trench touches that, it wasn't like the last war where thousands could be saved, where the first war, thousands were killed with simple wounds because they'd fallen in this water which contained poison and eventually died or had the leg or arm up. That in the First World War uh, wouldn't have occurred because the, the medical part of it was very, very, uh, well, I only just started. My ankle was never x-rayed. Were you allowed to stop and, and help somebody who had fallen into a shell hole filled huh. with mud? That, uh, that was the usual thing to do. On the, the first one or two engagements we had, naturally, if you saw a fellow was hit, uh, and, and you'd been with him since you joined up, as a friend and a comrade, and they were screeking for help. Uh, and you was a yard away. Naturally, you go to them, you pull him to the dry spot you could find, and uh, do what he asked you to do. And, uh, uh, and his plea was, help me down to the, uh, out of the trenches, you see. Well, a lot of, a lot took that uh, uh, help in the wounded out. And of course, what happened, they take their friends out to the dressing station and uh, they, uh, they was given a cup of tea for their help and they'd sit on the grass where it was and the inevitable was they went to sleep because uh, one of the things we never had enough of was sleep. And that man was woke sometimes perhaps Oh, four or five hours later. And who was waking him but a military police? And he says, what are you doing here? Oh, I came to bring my friend down. I must have fallen off to sleep. But no, that's no good. He's arrested and charged with deserting. So, you see, that stopped everyone giving a help to a wounded man, even if it was your brother. So were there orders? Were you ordered... You, you, you told, describe for me, as you did once before, what it was like to leave, to leave the trench and not be able to stop and help somebody who'd fallen into a shell hole. Uh, that was exactly what they bought the order out for. You see, so many people, so many soldiers was doing that, seeing their pals, uh, couldn't walk, naturally. They, uh, their cry was because so many was killed and injured that the few men on the Red Cross uh, was absolutely outworked. And in any case, it was far too dangerous in some places for the Red Cross men to, uh, to get to them because to try and get to them, they'd be killed themselves. It was too near the enemy. So just describe that walk for me. You... you it's winter. Remember, you told me once before, you described the walk from the trenches in the winter when the shell holes were, were filled with mud. Yeah. Can you... Oh, yes, that was an occasion that I saw a man drown. Right. Tell, t describe that for me um, so, that I can, so that I can see it, too. Yeah. Well, it was the end of our 
trench eight eight days, and uh, we was relieved by another one, uh, another regiment. But the walkout, which was two to three miles, and as I've said before, the the real trench, the communication trench, was absolutely blown to pieces. So we had to walk on the top, and. Uh, there was only a short space between the, the big shell holes, only a yard or so, and don't forget, it's pitch dark. And there's very lights, which the English and the Germans put up at night so they could see anything. And uh, walking along there, I heard a chap cried for help in a, in a big shell hole, deep. He would fell in there, slipped in, you see, and with his uh, kit and rifle, waited, pulled him down. Well, his hands were scraping the edge uh, and he was crying to everybody passing, including me, uh, for help. Well, I couldn't stand that. So I got my rifle and I said, hold this. And we pulled and pulled and build. And he was only one of many that was safe from drowning because he came it came a practice for men who passed pals in, the sh in these shallows, drowning, couldn't get out of the hole, what with what they was carrying, and no, nothing, nothing to hold, uh, to pull us around. They offered the rifles, and in a lot of cases, most every case, the man in the water was the strongest, and he pulled him in. And instead of one death, it was two deaths. And then the next day, the stern order came in. On no account, under no circumstances, would anybody stop to help a wounded man. So then, what? what Excuse me. Okay. <coughs> we have to change the tape again. When, when the, the orders were issued that you couldn't help anybody, did that mean that you would walk by people in... Exactly, yes. T tell me about this. How did, how did that make, make you feel? Well, uh, some, of course, uh, didn't uh, attempt to do the order. They, they thought it was too bad. And, of course, they got into trouble. And they, were, uh, and they, they had a, a small prison sen sentence for just uh, that. But, but actually, uh, you, you've got to remember it's pitch dark at night. And uh, uh, w everyone had learned that it was dangerous to offer your rifle to the drowning man because it happened nine cases out of ten, they pulled you in, you see. Uh, so uh, they got to ignore it. And uh, it was just a case of one death instead of two. It was a, a right thing to do, but it seemed very, very harsh, as all the orders was in those days. But uh, uh, the officers in those days were not people you could talk to. They almost had to get a permission to speak to an officer. And... Uh, as I say, the discipline was terrible. But describe the scene for me. What what then did it sound like? Could you could you hear these men in the shell holes? <laughs> Not very well, because don't forget, at all times of the day, from morning till night, there's a huge uh, sound of machine guns, bombs, uh, planes in the air, and. Uh, uh, Shells of all sizes still going on. The shelling practically never stops. And you never know at, at, at what part they, they go. To. It may be a yard from you, it may be a hundred yards from you. But that's when you get out on the top from the trenches and you're going out, it's a risk you had to take. Uh, your experience told you when shells are coming over, if they're coming near you or away from you. And that was the only way 
in which a lot of people save their own lives because like us then had been out some time and uh, knew all these little sounds and things which simple as it sound would save your life wait one moment there there's a noise so what was that experience like to come out of the church not having had much to eat how did you get food and then what was expected of you yes well when we'd been in the trenches and uh, it had been nothing but uh, shells and bombs practically uh, from day and morning till night, as it often was, with no, uh, the Germans wasn't prepared to come over, but they was just giving us all they got in the way of shells. And uh, after seven days, it was reason to believe that the party who was supposed to come up and bring you food and water uh, never got there. They was either killed or in injured and the food scattered in the mud. So uh, fortunately or unfortunately, it's hard to believe, but we had to search for dead bodies who had some food on them. And but more than that, had perhaps a, a flask of water. Other than that, uh, I don't think we could have stood up to the uh, conditions that we were forced to fight in. And uh, uh, we did do, do fairly well because of the dead bodies, some of them had food which had been sent by relatives uh, from England. And of course they carried it in the trenches. And that was a godsend to about three or four of us who was looking. And uh, we felt no qualm at all at the fact we was robbing the dead. Nothing at all. And as I've told you before, uh, when you're, uh, they treated the dead as nothing, like a piece of wood. It's got to be useful. That is why they was put in the trenches where we got to stand, and we stood on them, because uh, by doing so it made us dry. Of course, these bodies were recovered later, but if they left it too long, they found the body, but the head was a skeleton because the rats had chewed them. And to see a body with just no face but a skeleton would shock the most modest of men. You saw this? Beg pardon? You, you saw this? Did, did you see Did it? I see it? <laughs> I saw skeletons galore. I, if you left a body in a place where it was dangerous for four or five nights, the whole lot, the clothes is torn to pieces and there, there's a perfect skeleton there, all the flesh, the rats of it. And uh, uh, there are many books showing that, war books, and uh, official books that I've read, uh, that was one of the most terrible things to, to see. Did you ever have to bury, did you, was it ever your job to bury? Oh. Yeah. Yes, uh, on Christmas morning above all, I was called out because uh, I haven't told you, but Annie and I uh, uh, volunteered for night uh, uh, night uh, experiences uh, to go to the German trench and view their wire and uh, how many men they had behind them. In other words, it was a, a dangerous quest. And uh, uh, because of that, we had, we was s s saved for going over the top twice and it was worth that. It was a dangerous job, but that was a reward. But now tell, tell me about Christmas Day. Yes, uh, I was called out with several others that a sergeant was gathering together. And I says, what, what's the job? And he says, you better have this first. And he gave me a stiff drink of the British rum, and honestly, 
once you had a drink of that, you'd take on the German army. It, uh, and uh, an headquarters about a mile away had been hit by several shells and killed everyone. Not only killed everyone, about 20, but blown them to bits. And our light little job was to gather up the bits in a sack and take all the particulars that every soldier carries round his neck. It took about an hour or so, but that was our Christmas morning job. And where, where does the strength to do such a task come from? Where does what? The, the strength to do a task like that. Well, I'd been out some time uh, and my brother and I, for some reason, uh, we grown uh, what used to bullets and bombs, and uh, we grown. Especially my brother, he, he would, didn't care for two oats for hundreds of Germans, and uh, although I used my brother, he was the bravest man on that field, and uh, uh, together. I think uh, we never felt afraid or anything as much as the other people did. Why not? Why did, why well, did other people panic and, and you didn't? Uh, well, in the first place, most of the, uh, of the uh, exhibitions, uh, the, uh, the things we had to do, which the main people didn't do. We were on the list, top of the list, the Brothers Francis, anything dangerous. On one night, we proposed to take the sentry, the German sentry, and bring him back alive to our line. There was about 15 of us on that occasion. And we got near the wire as possible. We had to cut a little passage to, to get right, uh, and we saw there was only a young fellow, a German, uh, who was walking up and down the German trench, and uh, three of our strongest men leaped onto the trench, picked him up, and literally thrown this little German, only about my own age, out. And of course, we had to slap our hands over his fa face because he, he was uh, screaming and screaming. But fortunately, we brought with us. Uh, a chap who did a little uh, German, and he told him to be quiet, and uh, he was lucky. The war for him was over, and we treat him very good, and he, he was quiet. But by this time, the Germans had missed the century, and all hell broke loose, because they, uh, the, the, the exit for us across the trenches, some... Uh, 200 yards, was absolutely pounded with bullets and bombs and shells. And we had to find, with the German prisoner, we had to find the deepest hole we could, and we stopped there for over an hour till all this firing stopped, and then it was safe to creep back to our own lines. Which were people more fearful of, the bullets or the shells? What was the difference? <laughs> Not much. Uh, either things kill you, so they was all the same. Uh, bullets uh, was slightly preferable because they was clean and not like shells which battered a lump out of you or give you fearful, fearful wounds. And of course, the, the, the wounds were so bad that uh, in those days, if a wound was bad, they didn't bother to try and and I took the leg off. Did you ever see a friend of yours, a close friend of yours, get wounded? Ah, the closest friend ever, next to my brother. We three always went together. And he was about six or seven yards in front of us on a... Uh, we was uh, made to take a, a village which was about two or three hundred yards ahead. And of course, it was a very hot time, bullets and bombs and shells everywhere. And this uh, friend of ours got a very bad wound in the leg. 
and he screams, honestly, sometimes at night I could still hear them. Absolutely scream. His lid was nearly off. He got a terrible wound there because he couldn't stand. And he kept screaming and screaming and screaming till that got slow, slower and slower and quieter and quieter. And of course, in the space of about 20 minutes, he was dead. But there was a case that although he, he pleaded with us and my brother to come and help him, it was we couldn't do it. We should get ourselves into severe trouble. As I've told you before, they, 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 we'd got to stop that. Uh, and uh, we had to walk past him. And the terrible thing is that he was one that stopped there two days because where the position was was very dangerous for the Red Cross man to approach him. They'd get killed themselves, so they had to leave him a couple of days. And that couple of days, it was a skeleton on his head. The rats, rats had chewed him. And the, the more bodies there was, the more hundreds of rats we had. You could understand that. Bloated, as big as rabbits. Uh, 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 and, uh, that's the reason. Bodies was lying out in the field all over the, the, the trenches and in the, uh, in the, the open. And you see, it was too dangerous for the Red Cross men to oppose. And believing that they was dead, which they were, there was no hurry to go and get them in. But the rats see to that, they'd just come along and eat them. But I often wondered, there was a terrible death in its own, but to be eaten by rats, I wonder what the mother and father, if they knew the truth, which they never did, of course, would think if that's the way their son died. Where were you when, when you heard your friend calling for help? Where were you? How could you oh, hear? Oh, uh, practically a couple of yards, but we was, we was advancing, you see. We was advancing towards uh, uh, our objective. And we couldn't, on the strict orders, stop and attend to him. We should have had an officer with a drawn revolver on our heels straight away. And we, we couldn't, couldn't do that. It was a godsend, really, that he died as quick as he did. In today's uh, time and medical, he may have stood a chance, but not in those days. Did you, did you ever come into contact with, with any tanks? Who? Tanks. Did you come into contact with any, without it, with any tanks? Tent. Tank. Tanks. It's my accent. Science. Tanks. Tanks. Let me, I'm going to creep forward. Did you come into contact with any tanks? Cake. Tanks. You know, the big armored vehicles. Oh, the tanks. <laughs> <laughs> the tanks. Yes, uh, 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 the book I showed you showed that I was in a tank. But, but tell me, in your own words, what the experience was like for you. Yeah. Des describe the scene for me. Yeah. Well, of course, when we first heard that I was making tanks, and we first saw the first tanks, uh, well, we was wild-eyed, really. They weighed approximately 30 tons, and they looked... Terribly, you know, uh, uh, good for the job. But that was good for the job in dry land. The moment they got into mud, uh, as what we had in the winter, hopeless. They were bogged down in no time. And uh, some of them got halfway in a big hole, as deep as this room, in a shell. And half of their side went down and they were stuck. But I was in the tanks... Uh, like a fool, I, I volunteered to do it. Uh, they started at the bottom of a little rise, and the moment they got to the top of the hill, they was in, uh, in line for German shells and bullets. And they thought of a brilliant idea. Uh, there was four tanks. They said, if we have two men on every tank, 
with rifles fixed to the back with smoke bombs in them. And when we get near the top, we want two infantrymen to fire those bombs so that the Germans won't see what's coming. Uh, that'll be all right. Well, they wanted eight of us, four tanks, two to a tank. In the first place, it was absolutely a ridiculous idea and uh, uh, it was 20 to 1 in odds that no one would come back because the moment the Germans saw a tank approaching, especially uh, as it was the first or second attempts they'd ever see one, they threw every shell and bomb and bullet at it. And uh, all round that tank, remember, we was outside, not inside, pulling the rifle, put, putting smoke bombs in the rifle and fire. Uh, you might just as well have smoked a cigarette and the difference it made. It made no difference at all. Only the fact that out of the eight, four got killed, two very serious of wound, wounded with limbs lost. Uh, the man who was with, with me absolutely went shell-shocked uh, and it was terrible. I had to drag him out of the... We got stuck, of course, in the tank. And I was the only one out of that eight to come out scot-free. Tell, tell me about shell shock. Ah, uh, shell shock. Shell shock was with thousands of, uh, of NCOs and, uh, and privates had. Practically everyone had shell shock. But some, it was terrible to look at. Some, as I've told you, uh, couldn't stand it and wanted to walk out, which inevitably they got shot. And on the official War Office records, 409 were shot. So uh, that's quite a number. So... Uh, how, how could you tell that somebody had shell shock? Well... <laughs> uh, about three or four weeks later that the man was arrested, whatever he'd done or not done, we was lined up at the back of the trenches when we was out of the trenches. We was lined up on a field. This is two or three mile out of the trenches. And a, a man on a horse, a, a red tab man, high man, a South African ribbons on, old enough to be my father. He pulled out a bit of paper and read that on such a judge date, Private so-and-so was found guilty of desertion in the face of the enemy and shot accordingly. But shell shock, when people just couldn't take it anymore, how could you tell when a man had, had panicked and basically lost his... his well, how, I mean, you, describe, you could tell my... Tell my wait, wait till I sit back. Yeah. But describe for me how you knew when a man was, was shell-shocked. Well, you could easily see when a man was shell-shocked. Because if it was a grown man, even more than my age, he was crying, he was shaking, his face was absolutely a different colour. And he was moaning, crying, and uh, he liked the boy who got shot. Uh, and it was as much as we could do in the trenches to hold him back, even to sit on him, because once he started to get out of the trenches, he was a dead man, and that's all we could do. But uh, to describe shell shock is uh, one for the private and one for the officers. The officers, of course, oh, the officers had shell shock, the slightest sign of a trembling of the lips and the officers go down to the medical hut and they say oh yes sir, we'll send you to hospital for a week and then when that week is done they will send you to England to recover and he's got shell shock the same as hundreds of privates and corporals of that have got it but when they go by they are threatened with being shot and given a dose of medicine or whatever they got and sent back into the line that was the difference.
Do, were you afraid that you would crumble under this under the pressure? Never. Only once so I was I wasn't afraid, but I was afraid of falling. And that was when I've uh, described you coming out of Passchendaele. We got to walk at least two to three miles, and my legs couldn't uh, hardly carry me. I was frightened of falling in shells because I knew if I did, I hadn't the strength, absolutely exhausted, as was the other people. Uh, 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 that was the only time I did feel a little afraid. I was afraid for my old life, naturally. And can, can you just describe that scene for me? Describe that scene. What was so frightening about it? Oh. Well, we'd done seven or eight days in the trenches. We'd lost about 50, 60, 70 men killed and wounded. Sometimes our battalion would go in a thousand strong and come out 300. Come out 300. That was when the Somme started. But uh, that walk out w would take hours, sometimes three, four, five hours before you staggered in to a safe place behind the lines and you got uh, a warm drink and some good food which they had ready for you. And what would you, what would you, what would you have to walk by on the way? What did it, what did it look well, like? What did it sound like? Uh, you must understand you couldn't, if you could see a yard or less than a yard in front, you have to look at the ground and mind where you're standing. Remember, in the winter it's pitch black dark and you're lucky if you don't stray away from, see, you're in a, a single line of men and you touch, put out your hand and touch the back so that you know you're keeping touch with him. But if you lose that touch, you lose yourself. You, you you can't possibly get out of that lot. You might just as well uh, sit down and wait for the morning, because it, it was it was highly dangerous to to walk. You see, someone ahead was carefully, probably an officer, carefully finding out with a with uh, rifle butt if it was safe to stand on or near a big shell hole, and he was the leader and generally a good man at that. And would you have to, and did some people slip? Did, did people slip? Oh, many s slipped as I've told you, many died. Quite, it was, if we came out about three or four hundred strong, it was nothing to lose 50 coming out. But what with uh, bullets, bombs and the water being drowned. Could you hear them in the water? Could you hear them in the oh, water? They were shouting as far as they can, but all the shouts in the world didn't stop them slowly sinking. And once, of course, it covered the head, they was finished. You see, the sides of a shell hole were nothing to hold. It was just plain mud. And if you stick your fingers in it, they simply slid down. You couldn't pull yourself up in any way. Once you got in a shell hole and you sank, that was it. You, you couldn't get out yourself. And what, what did... Do you think that the people at home understood what you were going through? They understood not a thing, I don't think. To, to try and tell your relations, your mother and father, uh, the conditions, they'd look at you as if you were pulling the leg or putting it on a bit. But the truth, we spared them such things as rats eating bodies, of course we wouldn't mention anything like that. But at least some did, and it caused a sensation. But there was one case I'd like to remember uh, to tell you, there was a boy, 16 and a half, nearly 17, and he was in the battalion, and uh, the parents, reading in the paper the terrible casualties was having, wrote to the war office and say, my boy's only 17 and he shouldn't be in France. Of course, 19 was the age to be abroad. 
And they wrote to the fort, say they don't mind him being in the army, but he must be sent back to England, as he's not old enough to be out there. Because they were frightened. Uh, the, 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 the death roll calls was coming in every week. The reply from the war office said that they examined his entry when he, uh, when he uh, was uh, first in the, in the army, read that he was 19 years of age when he signed up, and that we must take. And they wouldn't let the boy come back, and he, the 12 months he died, he was killed. That's, uh, that's how, that's how the <coughs> discipline was. With the switch tapes, with the change tapes. What, what were you told to expect at the sum? Did you know what you were up for at the Battle of the Sum? Did you know? Did you know how big that battle was going to be? Oh yes. How much? Yes. How much did you know in advance? Hmm? How much did you know in advance about oh. the Battle of the Sum, and what what did you expect, yeah, and what, how was it different? Oh, it was told by officers it was coming up. Uh, long before the, bat the Battle of the Somme, which uh, was on the 1st of uh, July, 1916, uh, we had heard the guns going for at least 10 days. And there must be a thousand guns if there was one. It was a terrible roar from morning till night. And we all thought that that alone would be enough to smash the Germans. But uh, the reason why we lost so many, that tens of thousands were killed on the first day, was the foolish officers who came and had the four square and gave us a little talk beforehand, before the morning. And he said, tomorrow, boys, You'll be over the top, and don't worry, he says. There'll be no tr trenches there. Our shells have blown to pieces. There'll be no Germans there. They're blown to pieces. And there'll be uh, uh, nothing at all. All you have to do is to walk over and take those trenches and start building them for your own use. In fact, he says, you can carry your rifle like a bag. And that speech alone must have killed thousands upon thousands because that's exactly, I should mention, that our battalion was not on the first day. Thank God for that, as I shouldn't be here today. And he said, you have no opposition at all. Well, what happened on that 1st of July when our chaps, it was a, a 40 mile, a 40 mile uh, the line was, and you can imagine there was a lot of men there, all got at the, at the given time, got on the top, walked along, as I said, and to the amazement of the Germans, who'd been there all the time, but in 15-foot dugouts, with plenty of machine guns, plenty of ammunition, plenty of food. In a German book I've read, the, doc the officer said, I never saw such a scene in my life of tens of thousands of British soldiers just casually walking across to us. But what did you personally hear after that first day? Did you hear what happened? Could you, did you well, find out about it? Uh, and, and from what you knew? Well, we knew about it later for the enormous casualties. Uh, 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 and you see, when the Germans who well, got a machine gun at every 10 yards, and they came out and they saw all this walking across, no attempt at firing or, or running or, or, or anything like that. They couldn't believe their eyes. So the officer gave the, the word to fire, and they dropped absolutely like nine pins. What, what was the philosophy, the philosophy of the officers Wave after wave, they kept ordering you soldiers over the top. 
Well, what, what's the idea? Uh, the idea was a big attack, but it was the way, way they told it. You see, they told us to get up and walk slowly over, as we shouldn't have any opposition whatever. Whereas, a month back, every time we went over the top, the orders were, as the whistle goes, you wait for a good opportunity, and a good opportunity means there's no machine gun bullets hitting the top. And you'll get up and dash for the nearest shell hole. Dash. Whereas this a soldier, well, I could call him he's a monkey, I should think, he told uh, this, this big line to get up and walk past because there'd be no opposition. The trenches would be not dug to pieces, the wire would be gone, the Germans would be all dead. And for, for weeks, the... The Germans have been busy making 15-foot dugouts which they stuck with food, water, ammunition and, and machine guns and a half officer here and there. And as I said, when they saw all this crowd all walking almost shoulder to shoulder, walking across, uh, they absolutely hesitated to open the guns, but they did. And that was the result on that day alone. We had 600,000 casualties. Were you soldiers angry? Were you angry? Mm. Were you sick of the whole thing at that point? Well, when that officer had gone, my brother and I walked away. He told us to, to walk over. And I would say we were fortunate. We're not in the first day. We started the third day, which wasn't quite so bad as the first. And, of course, we didn't walk over, as they said. He said, do you see that old so-and-so? He says, what does he know about trench warfare? The only trench he's ever seen is, is this in, in, in his whole life. And he got a row of uh, medals out of uh, the South, uh, South African world. He says, he don't know what a trench is, and he never, of course. But what they speak, they're off. Even a couple of three miles from the trenches, they're still too near. They live in houses 30 miles from the trenches. They are waiting on hand and foot. They have beds. They have change of linen. They have a chef in these big French houses. They have a servant to do everything. And uh, they live in the days when they was in South Africa. They know nothing about it. Uh, and that's why, really, in the first day alone, we lost 600,000 killed. And were, were you soldiers who knew a thing or two about the trenches? Were you angry? Were you oh, bitter? I put the blame on. And uh, I, I said they wasn't uh, giving an order. They murdered those men because they just sent them into a certain death by telling them to walk are not using the rifles or anything like that. You can't blame the Germans for taking advantage of me, but they, I've no doubt, well, I, I, I've read books, that they was more amazed than anything. How could you listen to your officers after that? Ah, but this was a very high man who lives, as I say, 40 miles away from the trenches. We very rarely, only once or twice in a month, he'd come to us and give us a bit of a lecture uh, and then gallop back very quickly or get his car and go quickly back home. I had no time for the officers, small or large. And uh, of course I, I fell out with the, uh, the military police only once. When I was wounded in the hand, and, uh, they put me some food which was supposed to be my lunch, I said I wouldn't give my dog that. And unknown to me, a police sergeant at the door, military police, heard it. And he followed me to the canteen where I bought some decent food. This is one of the few times we was out, well out, to a village where it, uh, shops was open. And uh, I, when I came out, he, hey, you, Name, number, regiment. I said, what's all this about? 
What's the charge? He says, uh, so tell it lies about the uh, army food. Uh, he says, you'll appear before the colonel tomorrow morning. Be here at nine o'clock. Well, I came there, and uh, an old man, well, he was old enough to be my grandfather, uh, at the desk, he pulled out a bit of paper before the policeman spoke, and he says, uh, six weeks' pay stopped. Can, can you describe for me the difference between how you lived on the front line with what most of you were used to? How, how different was it? Well, it was so different as uh, you couldn't get a comparison because it was so different. I mean, we were issued with hard biscuits, and they were hard. You could get a hammer, and you were on several blows to break them. But there was a uh, suppose. And when we ate our ordinary food, which we had uh, given before we went to the trenches, and we soon ate that because we were always hungry, uh, we had to try these biscuits, which was terrible. And uh, uh, lots of my friends there were saying, oh, for a so-and-so, a Sunday lunch, they said, that we used to have. They thought of the good meals they had at home, naturally. But uh, food, you see, in lots of times, they couldn't get to us because to to send about 10 men with food in, in sandbags was highly dangerous, especially in the daylight. If they came at night, they lost the way. And more often than not, uh, they were so wet and muddied that they simply dumped all the food and went back again. And what did No Man's Land look like? Describe it to me. Describe it to me who's never seen no. a battlefield. Well, if you'd seen pictures of the American conquest of the moon, it was something like that, only worse. Imagine the, the pictures you saw of the moon, all dug up and wet through with mud. That was what it's like. You could only crawl up to where you was going in lots of places. Impossible to walk. If you stood on your feet, you'd slip and you'd slip in the mud and you'd get more mud on, on your body. It was almost impossible to walk. And to get one mile would take a couple of hours. And what, living amongst the corpses in the trenches or the, the dead on the battlefield, can you remember what it smelled like or what it... <laughs> uh, to smell like, we had on the first month, I think, of the dead bodies. And horses as well. Horses got killed. And uh, that, to us, was... Uh, just like a seaside breath of air after we'd had mud sobby. We took no notice of it. It's, uh, for a person just coming there, it would stink to high heaven. But to us, who was used to it every day, we didn't think a lot of it. It was a stench, but we, we stood for it, and we, we stood up to it. We knew it wouldn't go away, and we knew we got to work by there, so we made, made up their minds to take no notice of it. And how about the noise? Was that something that you could take no notice of, the noise? Uh, uh, no. The noise was always on. Always guns and bombs, machine guns and bullets were flying around. And when you'd been as long in the trenches towards 1918 as Ali and I was, you could almost say for sure, if a shell was coming, whether it was going to drop by you. And if you thought it was going to drop by you, you'd flatten yourself in the mud as, uh, however deep it was. But uh, you got get so useful for shells breaking here and there that you think, oh, he's one comet, and it'll be 20 or 30 yards away. And it was. Uh, y you get an expert in knowing when you hear a, a shell roaring from the German side, especially the large ones, five nines, uh, you know to a very rough guide where those got to stop. Because most 
People killed by shells never hear it coming. It comes splash right at the feet and they're blown to pieces. And, and did you ever get religious or, or superstitious or was there, did you have faith that you would get through this? Well, towards 1918, you must understand, uh, February, uh, January, Monday, uh, February, we had no idea that in a few more months the world would be, the war would be over. And uh, uh, a friend who I, I knew, we were speaking to us, we'd just come out of a, a raid on a trench, and of course lost a good many men. And he says, uh, you and I must be lucky, Ted. He says, you, you, above all, he says, you come, you go in, you attack, you come back without a scale. I said, yes, I says, the good Lord must be looking after me. And I said, oh, he says, uh, you're a Christian then? I said, no. I said, I want him into church once in my life when I was married. And he laughed. But I said, I says, from now on, I said, I'll say a little prayer every morning. Thank you, Lord, for this day. That's all. And I did so. And funnily enough, not funny, nothing funny about it, but I come out till the last two weeks of the war. I didn't know it was the last two weeks, but uh, I got this ankle blown up then. And... Uh, no one was more amazed to me when I was in a uh, uh, hospital in, in England when the bell started ringing and the war was over. In any case, I shouldn't have gone back because I was on crutches for about two months. Did you, did you ever see any Americans? Did you ever see the Americans when they got there? Well, uh, of course, they didn't come over till 17 and it was... Uh, uh, early 18 before they uh, started to attack but uh, we were so 40 or 50 mile away from them so we didn't come in close contact with them I saw one or two officers talking to our officers and getting some information about this and the other about trench warfare but uh, I think uh, the Germans uh, the uh, uh, Americans attacked in uh, March, I think, March 1918, and from then onwards to the end of the war. What, and then they did a hell of a good job. What, what do you think won the war? Hey, what? What do you think won the war? Well, it certainly was no country by itself. Remember that besides us and the Germans and France, there was a lot of little countries with us. And uh, uh, it was all shared with great relief when it was over. Because, as I've said before, we was coming to the end of our men. And when the Germans, uh, the uh, Americans, decided to have a go, uh, I, I was absolutely, I could have said hooray. Because uh, I like the Germans, I like their discipline, I like their free and easy officers. And uh, uh, the idea I saw, uh, I heard rather, I was told that uh, a private uh, saw a civilian wanted to talk to their head man. Uh, this private came up to a, a, a tent they was in and said, Jack is someone to see you. Uh, if you'd have said that in British, you'd have been in prison. I, I have to interrupt because I think you accidentally said German and you meant American. Yes, I meant American. So why don't you very, very briefly tell me how the Americans were different than the British, very, in very briefly. Yeah. Well, the American soldier had uh, uh, much more to himself than the British soldier. There was not, not so much discipline there, which I found very good. And I applaud the Americans for having such an army that seemed to be on friendly terms with not only the officers, but the, the men themselves. Okay. 
is there is there anything that that happened any experience that you had in the war that that still affects you to this day that to this day well, you still feel <coughs> funnily enough what affected me more was a silly thing that we were told we had done. And I said, what's that? They, had, they said, I have two brothers in the same regiment. And how right he was. Because when my brother was in the trench, he, detest, he detested these uh, steel helmets. And uh, every chance he had, when nobody was looking, he'd take it off. And he was on sentry duty at uh, a quiet part of the line, quite, quite quiet. In other words, it was quiet as concerned with an attack. And uh, joking and talking with his pals in the trenches, he accidentally put his head an inch too high and he got a bullet from the front of his head to the back. Now, half an inch this way would have killed him, absolutely. And it was one of the few misses that the German snipers made because they were trained with special rifles. And uh, what worried me, you see, I didn't know anything about that. It was quite a distance for me. And the first thing I knew was some uh, soldier of our lot. He was uh, absolutely a ragamuffin. He came, and, his, and in his uh, Birmingham dialect, he said to me, your kid's at it. I says, what? He says, your kid's at it. I says, what do you mean? He says, one straight to the end. And they walked on. And I thought, one bullet straight in their door has killed him. And I didn't know. And I asked permission to go to the uh, first aid post to see if that was true. And they said he'd had a terrible wound, but he'd recover. So was it difficult to be in the same battalion uh, as your brother? It was a, uh, what, what, wrong to what, do. I'm sorry, uh, start again. Yeah. Now, now tell me. It was, everyone said it was wrong to have brothers in the same battalion. If he'd have joined a, a battalion, he might have been across the sea doing, and you wouldn't know anything about that. To, but to have a brother always by you, and to sleep with him, and, and to go up the trenches with him, they said was foolish, because you're bound to worry about each other, especially if you're apart, like I was on that particular day, about a hundred yards apart, and you'll get uh, a chap with no braids come and tell you y your brother's had one straight to the head. Of course, I thought, naturally, he was killed. And uh, I could only... Uh, I did, uh, thank goodness, that he was killed outright and not terribly wounded. And it sound, the whole experience sounds so dreadful. Is there anything that, that still pains you to this day? Do you still think about your friends that, that died there, or do you still, no. do you still see these, these scenes oh, at all? I do, really. What? I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, sometimes I go to bed at 10, and I'm thinking about the war 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning. I can't go to sleep. And it's of those things, my brother being hit, my best friend being killed, and all the others that I think about. And uh, I, I wonder while I'm lying in bed, how is it that I'm lying here and they're all dead? But uh, it gets me down a bit where well, it shouldn't be because I, I suppose in one word I'm lucky to be alive. Did you return to Birmingham as a, as a hero? Well, so they say in the papers. But I'd been out in France about 12 months. I'd wrote three letters home to my father. Of course, as I've told you, my mother has died. And uh, no response until I got a letter from a man who took over my father's pub. And... Uh, but, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the soldiers in general, all the boys coming back in general, were they treated as heroes? Not at all. 
If we'd want word, they're treated as mugs. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, st start again. In what word, they were treated as mugs. Oh, pro my, my question won't be there, so you, you begin. What was that? Go, I keep interrupting you. you. You go ahead and begin, and, and tell me. My question won't be there. So start with the soldiers. To answer what? Oh, yes. Well, uh, I could... Uh, it was uh, many years, because we used to meet in clubs, that I... I uh, started to forget the soldiers when they reached an age and died or... I, I'm sorry to interrupt again. The, the soldiers, when you came back from the war, yeah. were, you, were you treated as heroes? Tell, tell me what happened when you got back. Wh how well, soldiers in general? They were, they were treated as fools and bugs. Save your, serve your right for joining the army. That's all we got. We got a small pension that was run out in a post office in about six weeks, a few pounds each. After that money had gone, uh, there was no out-of-work pay or any other pay whatsoever. All the churches had locked the doors, there were so many going begging there. People in, uh, from the army, with one leg and one arm, went up the gutter selling matches to, to, to get a, a few coppers to live. And that was the Prime Minister at the time when the war was over. He said, welcome home, boys. You come to a land fit for heroes. And I altered that. I said, fit for monks. And I, I was up and down for five years before I really started work. So, looking back, this, this war... This war was not what you expected. No, no. Uh, the, what my experience in getting a job, in going back to my old firm, was uh, repeated a, oh, a thousand times over throughout the country. You go there, they look at you and say, what do you want? I said, I used to work here. Well, what about it? I said, I want my job back. And they laugh. They said, we're sacking them, not taking them on. Out, and they pushed me out. That was my firm that I worked for. And that happened all over the country. And for years, not weeks, for years, half the soldiers who returned couldn't find a job. So, a question that's jumping back a bit. What did you know about what Birmingham was doing for the war effort? Mm -hmm. I have to ask you, when you were telling me about the tanks, you mentioned you mentioned that you had been inside a tank. Yeah. What's it like inside a tank? An ordinary tent. No, a, a tank. Oh, a tank. Oh yes. Well. What uh, was it? What was it like inside of it? Terrible. If you could imagine a large oven, but you'd spilt paraffin and oil on, and it was getting hotter all the time. That's what it was like. And we. Uh, had to sit down on the floor, which was covered with oil, but we was inside the tank and not outside. And that saved our lives, myself and my, my, my friend who was with me. There's no doubt about that. And you, you mentioned, I mean, you told us that everybody, everybody expected the war to be short. Yeah. And you expected to be back by Christmas and That's, to be over. Yeah. Was there a point... For you, in the trenches, that you realised that this was going on, on, uh, on and on and on. We, we'd been out there, Harry and I, for about five or six months. And he came to me when he was out of the trenches. And he said to me, Ted, if we go to get out of this alive, no promotion. I said, no promotion, yeah. Don't accept promotion. And I'm not accepting it. I've been taught to now, and you'll be the same because you're on this list as a good man, you see. But and sure enough, I was offered a, a one stripe. And uh, they was partly annoyed because I refused it. And Harry refused it. But uh, we know... And I knew it was the best because 
those who had the one stripe, it was like a ton weight on their left arm. And not only that, they'd been to a school, a modern school, and learned how to boss over their few, uh, about eight friends, mind you, who they would be in charge of, what a lad scorpion. And when they came back, the friends said to me, I don't know what's happened to him. He doesn't smile, he doesn't talk to us. He's a different man. They learned in this school, just like the officers, you've got to be tough. You've got to show them you're the boss. You've got to show them when you speak, you jump to it. And none of the laughing friends as it used to be. And of course, it caused a rift in those eight people that he was in charge of. It caused a rift and they didn't like it. But the sequel was that when we get over the top, these newly made lance corporals was the first to shout, come on lads, over the top, follow me. And irrespective of bullets flying near the top of the trench, he'd jump up. And three minutes later, he was dying at the bottom of the trench. You see, he was told in all his lectures to show these people that you wasn't afraid of the bullets, etc., etc., etc. But it was suicide, really. One last time, descri describe for me that moment before you go over the top. Just that moment. Describe what it's like. Well, most most of the most of the people, most of the old chaps beside myself, was thinking the moment I get over this, if I get over, is to find a spot to bury myself in. Irrespective of rushing to where we are supposed to take a trench or a village, it's no good going over the top and rushing when uh, machine guns are absolutely cutting you about the, the middle of your body. You wait until you see an opening. And uh, if you do that, you might live to the next day. But a lot, do as they told, on the whistle, you go over, irrespective of where the machine guns fired And of course, inevitably, they drop back dead. Okay, and why don't, why don't you go ahead and tell me, recite for me your, your poem, the poem you've been wanting to tell oh, me. Oh, yes. Well, it is of the First World War. It's about two Cockney regular soldiers just before the First World War. And uh, it's called Spotty. And it goes like this. Spotty was my pal, he was. A ginger any bloke. An everlasting gas bag. And as stubborn as a moke. He gave us all up, he did. Afore he came to war. By sporting all his bits of fridge. What no one asked him for. He said to me, old son, he says, you won't set half a chance when I get in conversation with them demoiselles of France. I says to him, you shut your face. Oh, he says, all right, Monsieur Abbey. Don't hurt yourself. So long. Au revoir. But when we got our, our orders, you bet we wasn't slow, a singing Tipperary. It's a long, long way to go. At sea on the transport, spotty with his parley-booing ears. I nearly knocked his head off, cos he said I'd meld him ears. But when we landed, what a beano! How those Frenchies laughed and cried. And I see his old spotty swelling, ha! Huh. Fit to bust himself with pride. He was blowing them a kisses and shouting, Vive la France! Till the sergeant major copped him. And he says, Oh, I can't have any more chance. But we didn't get no waiting. Where we went to, nobody knows. 
And it wasn't like the fighting as you see in picture shows. We had days of hell together till they told us to retire. And Spotty's flow of language almost set the water carts on fire. But him and me were very lucky. A third of us were dead with their screaming black maniahs and the shrapnel overhead. But every time they missed us and they were a fire, oh, it was murderous hot. I'd spot it up and shout, encore, encore. I said, what's that? He said, that's French for rotten shot. We were lying down in all, yes, dog with our very hands, for you gets it quick and sudden if you moves about or stands. We were sharing half a fag, yes, turn and turn about, when I, I feel he moved towards me. And he said, oh, old mate, I'm out. His eyes, oh, they couldn't see me. No, never will no more. But his twisted mouth just whispered, So long, matey. Horrible. But there was none quite the same to me. Cos him and me were pals. And if I could have him back again, huh? You could keep your fancy girls, but he's talking French in heaven now, so it's no use feeling sore. But God knows how I miss him. So long, Spotty. All in all. That is a typical example how I've lost many of my friends in the war. How's that? I've said that little monologue for 75 years. I never saw it in print. I heard a man give it out twice, and I remembered it since. Um, were, were there ex many songs or poems? Were there songs and poems that helped people get through this? Oh, yes, you see, now and again, it was allowed, oh, 40 or 50 miles back, a, a few of you was picked out, not the regiment. And uh, <coughs> you was allowed to go to these concerts, you see. Some were professionals, some were amateur. And uh, that's where I heard you. And, and you had experiences like that? Yeah, well, most of my friends went like that. Talking to them a few minutes, a few minutes later, they're dead in the bottom of the trench, which this monologue, Spotty had got up and got himself killed, presumably in the head, you see. But I, I, I've rendered that little monologue practically all over England, and I've liked it. <laughs> and, I, and I wonder how on earth did I remember it for so far back, but I did. But uh, it pulls me about a bit when I recite it because I'm thinking of the friends I had lost the same way. Many, many friends. You lost many friends that way. If I. You you lost quite a few friends. Oh yes, it was the most common forms of death. 
by exposing your body uh, for only a minute or two. And these German snipers, they were wonderful shots. It doesn't matter if there was 100 yards or even 200 yards. Once you put your head above the trench, you were dead. And that, believe me, was a job because I was a first-class shot. They wanted to give me to shoot people in his, to be a sniper, more money. I wouldn't dream of it, and I told them so. I said, I haven't come here to murder people. They said, but you, you'll get uh, a better position in the trenches, you'll get more money, you, 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 you won't be so hard worked. They said, threw everything at me. Because I'd handled an air gun and, a, and a, a sporting gun before, you see. So, so you didn't personally want to shoot Germans? Not, in, not on that occasion. It was like a man coming to you and standing and saying, you're a fool, you're a so-and-so, and getting up and shoot him. That might have been because he was annoyed. But, but to be in your full senses and not angry at anybody, and to see a head pop up and you shoot and you know you've killed a man, I couldn't stand for that. And yet I could see all the other horrors of the war without turning a hair. So you didn't hate the Germans? You didn't want to personally? Not at all. The Germans were good fighters and some of the finest in Europe. There's no doubt about it. Uh, they do things while we're thinking about it. And uh, uh, even their tanks, when they brought them out, was better than ours. But of course, uh, I blame the Germans for absolutely listening to a man like Hitler, mm -hmm. which ruined their country. A different war. Yes, a different war. Well, I want to thank you.